Am I in the wrong for selling our family home because my pregnant sister-in-law ate my dinner? I apologize for the blunt title, but I'm in a hurry to get to work, so please excuse any grammatical errors. It's important to note that my brother and I have different fathers. I'm a 19-year-old female, and I lost my father to cancer last year. He left me 90% of his assets, including the family home that had been in our family for over a century. This home was passed down through generations. My brother, age 34, didn't have a close relationship with our father, but he did receive a $10,000 inheritance. At the will reading, my mother was upset about the distribution but received $10,000 herself, so she couldn't contest it. For the past year, my mother and I have been living in the family home. Initially, she acted as if it were her own, which I didn't mind. However, things changed in May when my brother and his 30-year-old girlfriend moved in without asking for my permission. They've proven to be messy, entitled, and rude housemates. In July, I informed them that I wanted them to move out by September because they weren't contributing financially and didn't even wash their own dishes. In August, they dropped the news that they were expecting a child, and my sister-in-law arrogantly mentioned, guess we won't be moving out now. This didn't sit well with me. However, when I reiterated my request for them to leave, both my mother and brother simply laughed it off. Things have only gotten worse in the past few months. They've become even more difficult to live with, and my mother seems to encourage their behavior while also insisting that I should treat my sister-in-law like royalty simply because she's pregnant. There was even an incident where I had to wait outside a McDonald's until it opened to get her a McMuffin. Now, here's where I might be in the wrong. Because my sister-in-law is pregnant, she's developed an enormous appetite. She's been eating everything in sight, including the cupcakes my friend made for my birthday. She devoured all six of them, and I didn't even get to taste one. I can't even prepare my lunch the night before because by the time I go to get it, it's already gone, and she'll wear a smug expression on her face while patting her belly, then laugh and say, I couldn't help myself blame the baby. If I attempt to safeguard my food in my room, my mother will use the spare key to enter, and my sister-in-law will even go through my mini fridge. About a week ago, I was running late for college and didn't have the time to make breakfast or prepare lunch, as I had work right afterward. Consequently, all I had to eat the entire day was a chocolate bar. When I returned home, I was ravenous. I cooked myself dinner and left it to cool while I went to use the bathroom. I couldn't have been in there for more than 10 minutes. However, when I came back out, she had devoured 70% of my dinner. I was absolutely furious, and naturally, she started crying. Both my mother and brother began yelling at me for making her cry, coming up with excuses like how she couldn't control herself, and how it was my fault for leaving food within her reach. At that point, I had reached my breaking point. I told them to leave, just as I had previously requested. Once again, I was ridiculed. However, here's the twist. Back in October, my uncle presented me with a life-changing offer for the house. A few days ago, I called him in tears, explaining the situation. He agreed to buy the house, but informed me that he would evict my mother and brother. They didn't react positively, to say the least. I've had to stay with a friend, and my phone has been inundated with texts. People are tagging me in numerous posts on social media, and I'm beginning to question whether I'm a terrible person for making my mother and brother homeless. I must admit, I expected a few comments, but this is overwhelming. Let me address some things since I'm currently on a break. Some of you have pointed out my grammar, which I acknowledge is far from perfect. I was actually walking to work, declining calls from my mother while making this post, and I almost decided not to post it. If I sell the house to my uncle, I will lose 100k. However, he has always been good to me, and this is one of those situations where I would feel better knowing it's going to someone in my dad's family. My mother told me that because of my age, I wouldn't be taken seriously if I tried to evict them. If I were to evict them and continue to live in the house, along with the high financial costs, I don't think they would ever let me live in peace. My mother has health issues, and my sister-in-law will move in with her parents. They won't allow my brother so I would essentially be splitting up a young family, as my mother put it. I plan to consult with a lawyer, and I will keep you updated as soon as I have more information. Also, for those who are curious, the house is valued at 2.5 million, and it's located in the heart of London. And yes, it's clear from the story that the sister-in-law's behavior is just one aspect of the overall disrespect and mistreatment that the op has been subjected to by their family. They believe they can behave that way in your own home? Absolutely not. 
I can completely understand why you took the actions you did. And when you mentioned potentially losing a hundred grand by selling it to your uncle, I initially thought, wow, that's a significant amount of money to lose. But then you revealed that the house is valued at 2.5 million. In that context, a hundred grand is a price well worth paying to rid yourself of all the stress. In my opinion, you are definitely not the one at fault here. Ruby Cooper says you're not the stupid one, and considering how they treated you, there's no reason for you to treat them any differently. You're in the clear, my friend. Your uncle is the one who's going to be handling the eviction. Eli Peterson also agrees that you're not the stupid one at all, and they commend you for standing up for yourself. Levi Bell states that you're not the stupid one either. They would sell the house, let your family face eviction, and probably wear a smug expression knowing that they'll be out on the street. Family means nothing if they treat you like garbage, and that's absolutely true. Now, I'm going to turn the question to all of you. How would you handle this situation? Would you proceed with the eviction even though your sister-in-law is pregnant, or would you explore alternative solutions? Now, I'd like to take a moment to express my gratitude for all your contributions yesterday. Yesterday was quite challenging for me as I revisited my own story, and I truly appreciate the opportunity to read and share these stories with all of you. Sharing these experiences allows us to connect on a deep level, as we all navigate through life's ups and downs. If you'd like, I'd be more than happy to share another story with you in the future. Now, let's dive into another story. Am I being stupid for not immediately telling my family that my missing cousin is staying with me? Late at night, my phone won't stop ringing because of my family's frantic calls. To keep it concise, my cousin Benjamin was forcibly outed about four or five days before his 18th birthday last summer. His parents, my aunt and uncle, arranged for him to be sent to one of those notorious camps they claimed could cure him. A fellow kid from his community had gone through this ordeal and came back clearly traumatized, so Benjamin refused to go. He ran away from home and sought refuge in different family houses. His parents didn't file a missing person report because they didn't want to appear bad to their neighbors. Instead, they told everyone he had willingly gone to the camp. In mid-October, Benjamin disappeared and reappeared in my city a week later. My wife and I ensured his safety and allowed him to stay with us. At first, he was hesitant to inform the rest of the family because people from the camp kept showing up to take him back. I consulted with a lawyer who reassured Benjamin that they couldn't legally take him. Three days ago, he finally disclosed his location to his parents. A few hours later, representatives from the camp arrived at my door but were unable to take him. My phone has been blowing up with angry calls from my family for the past two days, demanding to know why I didn't tell them sooner. However, Benjamin still doesn't feel entirely safe, and I wanted to ensure his readiness before involving the rest of the family. So, am I being stupid for handling it this way? Despite the fact that some people want to protect Benjamin, they are still upset with me for hiding him. So, am I being stupid for not disclosing his whereabouts until he was ready? Now, let's delve into an update to this story, which I'll read after going through the comments, as it seems like the right time for it in this particular narrative. In my opinion, this is an obvious case of not the stupid. If certain individuals believe that being gay needs to be cured, that's their issue. They are absolutely in the wrong and should not be anywhere near you or Benjamin. Those who support such harmful practices are misguided. You mentioned conversion therapy, and yes, that's what they call it. It's a deeply controversial and widely discredited practice that attempts to change a person's sexual orientation. I'm not an expert on this subject either, but I do know that it has been a topic of debate and concern in various parts of the world, including the UK. As for them showing up at your house, it raises serious questions about their intentions. It's essential to protect Benjamin from any potential harm, and it's good that you consulted with a lawyer to ensure his safety. Kidnapping or any form of coercion should never be allowed in such situations. Absolutely unbelievable. Isaac Price rightly points out that you're not the stupid. It's strange to even consider yourself as such when you're protecting Benjamin from those horrifying conversion camps. Keep standing up for him, ensuring he has a safe haven with you. Skylar Coleman echoes the sentiment, emphasizing that you're not the stupid. Homophobes who think being gay needs curing, and parents who endorse such practices are in the wrong. You're doing the right thing by protecting him. Landon Sullivan brings up the disheartening fact that the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals has ruled that conversion therapy is somehow protected by the First Amendment. It's indeed mind-boggling and should be labeled for what it truly is, 
torture. The fact that it's protected is outrageous and heart-wrenching. Ruby Cooper provides valuable advice, suggesting you should contact the police since the camp is attempting to kidnap Benjamin. Their persistence is sinister, and a restraining order against these individuals is crucial. Document every incident, take pictures, and encourage Benjamin to keep a record as well including any witnesses. You're certainly not the stupid. In fact, you're a guardian angel, protecting Benjamin from his evidently dangerous family and even seeking legal counsel. Benjamin's safety is paramount and your support is crucial until he's secure on his own. Indeed, the safety concerns surrounding Benjamin are deeply worrying. Hannah Foster provides some valuable advice, suggesting that if the camp people show up again, you should firmly inform them that they'll be charged with trespassing if they set foot on your property once more. As for protecting Benjamin when he goes out, it's a complex challenge. While he may need to go out eventually, ensuring his safety is paramount. Perhaps you could consider arranging for him to have a trusted companion or friend accompany him whenever he leaves the house. This might help deter any unwanted attention or harassment from those individuals waiting around. Now, addressing your feelings of guilt, it's understandable that you felt torn between keeping Benjamin safe and reassuring concerned family members. However, your primary concern is his safety, and it's reassuring to hear that you're taking legal measures and working on securing his vital documents. It's also important to clarify the religious aspect. You mentioned being Catholic, not Christian. Regardless of the religious background, what truly matters is the well-being and safety of Benjamin. Thank you for providing these updates, and please convey our greetings to Benjamin as well. Am I wrong for refusing to accept a slightly late assignment from a student with a history of disrespecting me? Here's the situation. I am an instructor for a college class, and this semester I assigned regular, small assignments that students must upload to an online platform. These assignments are discussed in class before the deadline. I set the platform to accept assignments until the beginning of the class each week at 10 a.m., and from day one, I made it clear that I would not accept any assignments submitted via email. Now, let's call this particular student Skylar. Skylar is the type of student who rarely participates in class but openly expresses boredom, which, while not a breach of conduct, has influenced my perception of her. Midway through the semester, we had to transition to online teaching due to external circumstances. I use Zoom for my classes, but I do not require students to turn on their cameras. Recognizing that students were feeling stressed and fatigued by the situation, especially on Fridays when they have busy schedules, I made an effort to end the class a bit early to allow them some rest. After I officially end the class, students usually disconnect from Zoom, but I remain online in case anyone has questions. Over the past few weeks, Skylar has consistently stayed online, but ignored my inquiries about whether she had any questions, indicating that she wasn't present during the class and was likely leaving Zoom open to give the impression that she was. At this point, I'm frustrated that she believes she can deceive me in this manner, even though there isn't much I can do about it. Is it unreasonable for me to refuse Skylar's late assignment when she has a history of disrespecting me? Here's the situation. I teach a college class online, and this semester I assigned regular small assignments that students must upload to an online platform. These assignments are discussed in class before the deadline. I've made it clear from the beginning that assignments won't be accepted via email, and the deadline is at the start of each class. Skylar, who has rarely participated in class and openly expressed boredom, often stays online but doesn't engage during the class. This morning, Skylar informed me that she couldn't upload her assignment on time but would send it via email. It's the first time she's spoken during our online classes. I responded by apologizing and explaining that I wouldn't accept assignments via email. I feel justified in handling the situation this way since Skylar isn't following the rules. However, I admit my response may have been different if any other student were in the same situation. I must confess, there's a sense of satisfaction in saying no to her, given her past behavior. But does that make me the one in the wrong here? In most cases, being late with an assignment should be the student's problem, as it's essential to learn the importance of punctuality. However, 
My potential bias towards Skylar based on her past attitude might cloud my judgment. If I treat her differently solely because of her attitude, then I may indeed be in the wrong, or it could be an everyone sucks situation. Zachary Rivera raises a valid point that I haven't directly confronted her about her behavior. Am I being unreasonable by refusing to accept Skylar's slightly late assignment, considering her history of disrespect? Let me provide some context. I'm an online college instructor, and this semester I assigned a series of regular small assignments that students must upload to an online platform. These assignments are discussed in class before the deadline. From the outset, I made it clear that assignments wouldn't be accepted via email, and the deadline is at the beginning of each class. Skylar, a student who seldom participates and has expressed boredom openly, frequently remains online but doesn't actively engage during class. Recently. Skylar informed me that she couldn't upload her assignment on time but would send it via email. This marked the first time she actively participated in our online classes. In response, I apologized and reiterated my policy of not accepting assignments via email. My decision was partly influenced by Skylar's past behavior, which I must admit might have clouded my judgment. Had any other student been in a similar situation, I might have responded differently. While there is a sense of satisfaction in maintaining consistency and upholding the rules, I recognize that it may be unfair to treat Skylar differently based solely on her attitude. In most cases, submitting a late assignment should be the student's responsibility, teaching them about the importance of punctuality. However, I agree with the feedback that it might be more reasonable to address her behavior, set limits, and consider accepting her assignment, given its minor delay. It's possible that Skylar's previous behavior might have a different explanation, such as computer issues. Therefore, I must consider whether I am in the wrong here. Kennedy Collins provides an additional context that this assignment accounts for only a small fraction of the final grade, making the penalty relatively minor compared to the overall course grade. Is it unreasonable for me to refuse my girlfriend's request to sleep in my new bed after she switched rooms? My girlfriend has always complained about me disturbing her in the mornings because she believes I sleep in too long. I find it challenging to maintain complete silence in the house after 2 p.m., and one day, a futon was delivered, prompting her to move into the guest room. She decorated the guest room extensively. In response, I decided to buy a new, large king-size bed and decorate the room that used to be ours according to my preferences. However, she made a big deal about us sleeping separately and insisted on me respecting her sleep routine when she got the futon. I believe she's overreacting and I expressed my discomfort with the idea of sleeping separately. I suggested finding an alternative solution, but she remained adamant about not allowing me to sleep on her futon. Instead, I upgraded the bed and decorated the room to my liking. When she tried to sleep in my new bed, I declined her request. Please note that while your original text doesn't explicitly ask whether you're stupid, I've retained the structure of your story and presented it in a more coherent and clear manner. Is it unreasonable for me to refuse my girlfriend's request to sleep in my new bed after she switched rooms? My girlfriend has always complained about me disturbing her in the mornings because she believes I sleep in too long. I find it challenging to maintain complete silence in the house after 2 p.m., and one day, a futon was delivered, prompting her to move into the guest room. She decorated the guest room extensively. In response, I decided to buy a new, large king-size bed and decorate the room that used to be ours according to my preferences. However, she made a big deal about us sleeping separately and insisted on me respecting her sleep routine when she got the futon. I believe she's overreacting and I expressed my discomfort with the idea of sleeping separately. I suggested finding an alternative solution, but she remained adamant about not allowing me to sleep on her futon. Instead, I upgraded the bed and decorated the room to my liking. When she tried to sleep in my new bed, I declined her request. Please note that while your original text doesn't explicitly ask whether you're stupid, I've retained the structure of your story and presented it in a more coherent and clear manner. Josiah Kelly's take is that everyone involved in this situation has their share of blame. He questions the compatibility of the relationship, given the issues at hand. Ham Head concurs with the everyone sucks here sentiment, emphasizing the importance of wanting her back in your bed and highlighting the discord in the relationship. Skylar chimes in with a perspective that she doesn't quite understand the desire for separate sleeping arrangements, but has read about others doing it. She expresses some uncertainty about the situation 
situation, Henry Ward poses thought-provoking questions about whether the refusal is motivated by spite or immaturity. He emphasizes the importance of open communication and making choices that contribute to happiness in a relationship. He also shares his own experience of sleeping separately from his partner due to snoring, clarifying that it doesn't detract from physical intimacy or affection. The discussion then delves into the topic of separate bedrooms in relationships, with some members sharing their experiences and preferences. The general sentiment is that it can work well for some couples, as long as it doesn't lead to conflict and allows for individual comfort and sleep routines.